So there's a lot of information on how people dressed through pictures and paintings, but fabrics and items of clothing themselves don't really survive that well for 500 years. Not only would time wreak havoc on organic materials, but also clothing was constantly being reused. So an old dress might be cut up into a pillow or used for curtains or something like that. So we don't really have the original items of clothing to be able to look at. But we can tell a lot about fashions, as I said, from paintings, from accounts and financial notes, and also from writings. For example, in Utopia, published in 1516, Thomas More described the fashions of his ideal mythical country. Quote, They have no tailors or dressmakers, since everyone on the island wears the same sort of clothes, except that they vary slightly according to sex and marital status and that fashion never changes. These clothes are quite pleasant to look at, and they allow free movement of the limbs. They're equally suitable for hot and cold weather. And they're all homemade. This would have sounded really strange to the Tudors, for whom clothing displayed your rank in an age that was really status conscious. So in the mid-16th century, a book titled The Book of the Courtier by Castiglione was making waves as it spread through Europe, giving advice and etiquette lessons to a generation of social climbers. He believed, and he wrote in his book, that any kinds of extremes of fashion should be avoided and that one should really adapt yourself to the custom of the majority. This was an area where the English certainly did not take his advice. Clothes were so important as a symbol of rank to the English that there were laws called sumptuary laws that dictated what people were supposed to wear in really great detail. In 1533, for example, a law passed stating that you needed to have an income of above 40 pounds a year in order to wear any silk velvet at all, even a hat. If you had an income of 200 pounds a year, the equivalent of a knight or a son of a lord, for example, you could wear a gown of silk velvet. Only noblemen could wear scarlet, crimson, or blue silk velvet. Sumptuary laws weren't actually new to the Tudors. When Henry VIII called his first parliament in 1510, they passed a sumptuary law which built on an earlier act of 1463 and another in 1483. And then Elizabeth, in her turn, built on these acts as well, citing, quote, the excess of apparel, and the superfluity of unnecessary foreign wares, unquote. And in 1559, she put the responsibility of ensuring that the laws were enforced in the hands of the magistrates. These laws were important to keep the class system going. It's really important to have a clear distinction between groups if being upper class is really going to mean something. And it was during the 16th century that the middle classes really began to take hold and you saw signs for the first time really of upward mobility. And even within Henry's own cabinet, men like Cromwell could rise through education from being lowborn to being a person who, for all intents and purposes, could actually run a kingdom. It was important to the nobles to ensure that the up-and-comers were kept in their place. And also, if you did make it, You really wanted to flaunt it and show off your good fortune and your hard work if you made it to the upper class. And finally, the laws also ensured that there were fewer imports and foreign fashions coming in which tried to support English commerce. If you broke the sumptuary laws, you were fined and you could face jail time of up to three months. But it could be really difficult to enforce the laws. For example, When Elizabeth tried to stop neck ruffs on clothing from becoming excessively large, the Lord Mayor had criticized a man named Mr. Hewson, the son-in-law of the Lord Chief Baron, for wearing, quote, excess of ruffs in the open street, unquote. Mr. Hewson refused change, and the Lord Mayor pressed him. The Lord Chief Baron was so upset that the Lord Mayor was forced to write a letter to the Lord Treasurer asking for help in mediating the argument. I'm not going to go into the details of the sumptuary laws here, and they were in fact really detailed. But in the show notes for this episode on the website, I've linked to a few sites that outline outline laws 
have a flow chart on one of them. The Tudor Wiki has a flow chart. And if you want more detail, you can check those out. So what kinds of clothing did the average Tudor or Elizabethan wear? Obviously, fashions changed over the course of the 16th century, just like fashions from 100 years ago changed till now. So you can't make a blanket statement about the 16th century. For example, Spanish headdresses and certain French fashions changed as support for France or the empire changed. But in general, there are certain pieces of clothing that were universal. Starting with the first layer, both men and women wore underwear made of linen. It was an easy cloth to wash, and so it was good for the first layer of clothing. The underclothes would be a shirt for a man and a smock for a woman. Men also wore linen drawers, though they were not generally worn by women until the 19th century. Some people mentioned bodices or corsets for women, and an archaeological dig recently turned up something that resembled a modern-day bra, but it's hard to know for sure exactly what those undergarments looked like. The next layer for women would have been a woolen kirtle. It was similar to a dress with short sleeves or longer laced sleeves that could be rolled up for work. Finally, on top of that, you would have the gown, which was like a second dress worn in sort of a similar way to how we would wear a coat. For very high-ranking noblewomen, she would wear her best gown all the time, and all that was seen of her kirtle was the front. And if you imagine the way the portraits show the women at this time, I've put some actual portraits in the show notes on the website. So you can see this effect. It's generally the gown that goes over this kind of underdress. And you see that coming out through the front of the clothing. So for men, getting dressed was more complicated than today as well. First, you needed your hose or your breeches, which would go from the waist down to the knees. Then nether hose, which are stockings, they would cover your legs down from the knees to the feet. You could have garters to keep the hose from falling down. And then above your hose came a doublet, which was sort of like a jacket. Sometimes you would wear a jerkin over the doublet and possibly even a gown or a long coat over the jerkin in the earlier part of the century, though this was later replaced by a cloak. And of course, the famous, or at least going by Henry VIII's portraits, codpiece. It was worn by every class of man, rich and poor, and it was simply a decorated flap that fastened by means of laces to the upper hose to allow for easy access, sort of like a zipper today. The next thing worth talking about is laundry and general cleanliness. You know, we tend to assume that people were dirtier then. And certainly by our standards with hot running water on demand, they would have been. But in general, cleanliness was something that was praised and was a goal. When Henry VIII died in 1547, his closet had 33 linen shirts. And wills show that in Essex, particularly at the end of the 16th century, when shirts were mentioned in wills, there were usually between three and six, which meant really that each person would have enough to see them through a week wearing a shirt just once or twice before laundering it. So, you know, not that much worse than we are today. And like I said before, most people wore wool during the 16th century, even wealthy people. It wasn't just a cheap fabric that was worn just by the lower classes. People would wear it for their petticoats and their undergarments, especially since it was really warm and soft. And there was a great variety of wool on the market. So you could have all different types of wool from really expensive to then there was broadcloth, which was an inexpensive option for liveries. And also then there was kersey, which was a cheaper wool worn by poorer people. In addition to the kinds of fabrics you wore, the colors that you wore also showed the kind of class to which you belonged. So bright colors were really expensive to dye, as were very dark colors like black. The best, most expensive dyes would have an even color throughout the fabric. Most people wore clothing that was much less colorful. 
though black was the most popular color for most men for their special holiday clothing. It looked formal, but it would hide dirt, so it was completely practical, just like today's black suits, which look distinguished and formal, but still allow you some leeway if you accidentally write on yourself, like I seem to always do, or spill your coffee, or do otherwise klutzy things. <laughs> 